as we continue in the upper room discourse, and we read in verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I want to talk about the apostles. This particular verse pertains especially to the apostles of Jesus Christ whom he chose in the beginning of his public ministry. So we're going to be talking about these very important figures in the history of the New Testament church. And it's extremely important that we understand their office and their influence that continues to this day. Because it is owing to this that we read in verse 16 that you're sitting in this room today and that we have this church and that we will be observing this ordinance. And I'll explain how that is as we move forward. These men play an extremely important role in the scheme of God's religion, particularly Christianity. I think they are the fulfillment of what I read in your hearing this morning in Isaiah 32. A king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. And it is by their judgments and their decrees that we are governed in this church. I think they are the princes that rule in judgment. They are the princes of the church, not the papacy and the cardinals. They are. And they are so important in the scheme of things. I'll even go so far as to say in the eternal scheme of things that their names are engraven in the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. And thus what they are and what they have accomplished is preserved in eternal memory. Does that make it important? One of these apostles, Paul by name, In the shortest epistle that he wrote, the epistle of Philemon, written to a single Christian, to Philemon, talked to him and said in verse 19 of that single chapter, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Here was a man that had been converted under the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and Paul said, you owe me your life. So do I, and so do you. Not eternal life, but the life we have in this world lived in fellowship with God and in the service of Jesus Christ, we owe that to the apostles. We owe them our life. So I think it's important that we pay attention to as to why it is we owe them our life. They have provided for my life personally instruction. They have dissolved doubts. They've answered questions. They've given my life direction, structure, meaning, purpose. My whole ministry, my livelihood, I get from them. I owe them my life. Probably Conrad and I more than anybody else in this room. But the rest of you do as well. Now, it is important to remember when we're studying the Upper Room Discourse that it was spoken specifically and directly to the apostles. There were none other hearers present at this time other than the apostles of our Lord. And at this time, Judas Iscariot had gone out. So there was only the eleven remaining His place would be fulfilled after Jesus ascended back into heaven. And the church was gathered in Jerusalem and remembered the scripture that said, let another take his bishopric or his office, let another take. And they took from that as instruction that the office needed to be filled. And they did with a man named Matthias. So that now you brought the number back up to 12. And he was included in the twelve. I know that because after they ordained him to fill that vacancy, 
In the very next chapter, Peter rises up to preach, and it says he does so with the eleven. Peter's one at eleven, that makes twelve. So you're back up to twelve apostles when you fill in the vacancy with Matthias. So anyway, it's important to understand that this was spoken to the apostles. That means that there's some of the things in this discourse. Now, not everything, but some things are applicable exclusively to them. They don't apply to us, excepting indirectly. Now, some of those things in there apply to us as much as to them. For example, the commandment to love one another. We know that because that commandment is passed on to us in the epistles that are written to the churches and to brethren in general, such as 1 John. Or the fact of bearing fruit from abiding in Christ applies to all of us. And we can see that from comparing with other scriptures how believers bear the fruit of the Spirit of God. Uh, the, having the joy of Christ applies to us as much as it did to them for reasons that I've already explained. And on we could go. But there are some things that are particularly applicable only to them. And this particular verse is one such as I will expound it to you as we move forward. But first of all, let me just zero in on this thought. That there are some things that apply only to them. So what am I going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about this verse as it applies to the apostles. That they were chosen, that they were ordained, that they were sent forth. They went, brought forth fruit, and the fruit remains, if I can even get that far. But I will give you this sneak preview. We know their fruit remained. We know it's been around for 2,000 years and it's sitting in this room right now. You and I are the fruit of what these men taught in the New Testament. We're New Testament Christians converted by the gospel taught in the New Testament given us through the ministry of the apostles. We are the fruit of their ministry. Now, For example, just to show you there's some things in here that apply only to them, we need to go no further than chapter 15 and verse 27, where Jesus speaking to them said, Ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. That can't be said of any of us in this room. You weren't with Christ in the beginning, in the beginning of his public ministry. You weren't with him, but they were. Uh, In fact, come over to Mark chapter 3, where we have a record of when they were chosen and ordained. Because these are men that Christ chose. These were men that Christ ordained. And we're going to compare that verse with some other verses and we'll see that this is exactly talking about the apostles. But we come up here in Mark three thirteen. Speaking of Jesus, he goeth up into a mountain and he calleth unto him whom he would. Now that's an important phrase, whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve. What did he say in Mark, John fifteen sixteen? I have chosen you and ordained you. Here's where it happened. And he ordained twelve, watch it, that they should be with him. That was part of their job, was to accompany Jesus Christ in his ministry so that he could say to them near the end, ye have been with me from the beginning. Do you see that? And they came unto him, and that, he, that he, they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. And he said, I've chosen you and ordained you that ye should go. Why did they go? Because he sent them forth. All right. Now, another passage would be Acts chapter 1. They were to have been with him from the beginning so that they were personal witnesses of the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus taught. In Acts chapter 1, 21 and 22. Wherefore, this is when they're going to select a replacement for Judas Iscariot. And we read, Wherefore of these men, which had accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. See, they were with him from the beginning. When he went in and out. Of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. And the baptism of John marks the beginning of the New Testament era. And these men had been with him from that beginning. 
from the baptism of John under the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And so, there you have it. They were the ones that had been with Christ from the beginning and were therefore his witnesses. Now, while you're in the book of Acts, turn over to chapter 10 and you're going to see that the book of Acts is an account of their going out and bearing witness of Christ having been with him from the beginning. He had chosen them to be his witnesses. The book of Acts records them being what he chose them to be. And while I'm at it, let me point out that the full name of the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. It is the story of what the apostles did going forth bearing witness of our blessed Lord. In Acts chapter 10, we're going to look at verses 39 through 42. And John is, or rather Peter is speaking as an apostle. And he said, we are his witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So see, they'd been with him from the beginning. They knew the things he did. They knew the things that he taught. They'd been with him. And we're witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of Judea, in the land of the Jews, pardon me, and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God. Get that? What did Jesus say in that upper room discourse? I have chosen you. So they're specifically chosen before of God, even to us, that's the apostles, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify. What does it mean to testify? It means to be a witness. They are witnesses that it is he that was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So Christ chose them to be his witnesses and the acts of the apostles record them being just what they were chosen and sent of Christ to be. And this witness, this witness of the apostles is recorded in the writings of the New Testament. This is the written record of the testimony, the witness they gave in answer to their calling, the choice of them to be exactly that. And let me show you that. Look at John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 20. John's Gospel, 20, 20, through, uh, uh, 20 30, and 31. John's Gospel. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. See, right where the apostles could see it. They were often called the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written. See, notice what they witnessed, they wrote. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. I want to ask this Christian church this morning a question. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you're sitting there dumbfounded, are you even hearing what I'm saying? Do you believe it? Now, where'd you get your information about that? Right here? From what the apostles wrote? That's why they wrote it. So you can have the information and believe it. There you go. So you see, their fruit remains. (laughs) But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Then on down in the next chapter, 21, 24, this is the disciple, and John's talking about himself, which testifieth of these things. See, notice they were his witnesses to give testimony of the things they saw, the things they heard of Jesus, and wrote these things. We have that testimony written down, and we know that his testimony is true. Then come over to 2 Peter. Give you another example of what they did with this testimony, this witness that they had. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 15. Yea, this is Peter writing, I think it meet 
As long as I'm in this tabernacle, in other words, he says, I think it's a suitable thing to do as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So Peter says, I've got a task here. I think it's proper for me to do, and that's to figure out some way to keep you people remembering what I've told you. Knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, I'm going to have to die soon, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor, I'm going to make an effort, that ye may be able, after my decease, after I die, to have these things always in remembrance. So Peter says, while I'm still living, I'm going to make an effort so that when I'm dead, you can remember what I told you. Now, what effort do you suppose that was he made so we could remember what he said after he died? What do you think it was? <laughs> he wrote it. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, 1 and 2. He'll tell you the effort he made so we could remember what he bore witness of. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which, see, he wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and here's what he was doing in both of them. In both which, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles, of us the apostles of our Lord and Savior. So that we could remember their testimony, their witness. Peter wrote it down. John wrote it down. And then come to 1 John. You're probably on the same page if you're like my Bible. 1 John 1, and let's look at what, what they did with what they bore witness of. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, John speaking here, and he's speaking in the plural, speaking of himself and other apostles in the plural. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. There's not a one of us in this room that could say that. We didn't see Jesus when he walked around in this world. We didn't hear him. Our hands didn't handle him, but theirs did. Of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness. See, that was what they were chosen to do, to be his witnesses. We bear witness and show you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. We're telling you about it. That's what the book of Acts is all about. They went about telling what they saw, what they heard when they were with Jesus, both before he died and after he died and rose again from the dead. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. But watch it now. And these things... What things, John? The things we saw, the things we heard, write we unto you that your joy may be fulfilled. Brethren, how do we know Jesus fed a multitude with five loaves and a few fishes? How do we know that? How do we know Jesus washed the disciples' feet? How do we know about the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transfigured before Peter, James, and John? How do we know any of that? How do we know he walked on water? How do we know he changed water into wine? How do we know? He didn't write and tell us. And there certainly weren't any cameras to record it. How do we know? Because the people that saw it wrote us and told us about it. That's how we know. They bore witness of what they saw. And what they heard. How do we know this upper room discourse was even uttered? How do we even know what was said? Because they were there, they heard it, and they told us. They wrote it down for us so we could know. So you see how much we are indebted to the apostles? We wouldn't even have our Christian religion if it weren't for the ministry of the holy apostles because they are the ones that transmitted it to us. Now, every book in these 27 books of the New Testament was written by an apostle, with the exception of two. And that is the Gospel of Mark. Well, actually, with the exception of three. One being the Gospel of Mark, and the other the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, both which were written by Luke. 
Neither Mark nor Luke were among the chosen apostles, and yet they wrote three of the books of the New Testament. However, notice something about Luke's writings. Go over to Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to read something that's going to show you that Luke's writings exactly accord with the accounts of the apostles who were eyewitnesses of these things. So basically, Luke was a stenographer recording what he'd gotten from, guess who? The apostles. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, and these things, brethren, are most surely believed among us too. Don't you surely believe this New Testament stuff? If you don't, what are you doing here? Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. Now, that's a definition of an apostle. Which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. I mean, I perfectly understand everything they were telling us from start to finish. It seemed good to me, having had that understanding, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mayest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So notice that Luke's writings accord perfectly with the eyewitness account of the apostles. And furthermore, Luke's writings were certified by an apostle to be scripture. So we know they were inspired. Luke chapter 10, verse 7, Luke records these words spoken by our Lord when he sent out the 70. And he told them, he said, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. Boy, that would have been a test for me because what if they'd given me pizza? I guess I would have had to eat it to be faithful. And the Lord said, if you eat anything harmful, it won't hurt you. So I'd have had that going for me. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. But they didn't have pizza back then, so that's the nice thing. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. That's what I'm after. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Now come over to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5 and notice the Apostle Paul doing something quite interesting. In Luke chapter, um, 1 Timothy, pardon me, chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul's talking about giving to ministers of the word. Those that are taught in the word should communicate to them that teach in all good things. Support the man that teaches you God's word. That's what this is dealing with. And he gives you some scripture to tell you why you should. In 1 Timothy 5, 18, For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, which is a quotation from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25, 4, and the laborer is worthy of his reward, which is a quotation of Luke chapter 10 and verse 8. And thus the Apostle Paul is certifying Luke's writings as Scripture, just as much Scripture as one of the five books of Moses. And then we want to show you that both Luke and Mark were associated with Paul in his ministry. While you're in 1 Timothy, flip over to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11, where Paul says, only Luke is with me. So that tells me right there that Luke ministered under apostolic influence. Only Luke is with me, but then he says, take Mark. That shows me Mark was also under apostolic influence. And bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And then come over to First Peter. Not only was Mark under the influence of the Apostle Paul, but he was also under the influence of the Apostle Peter. In fact, so much so as these verses will re- this verse will reveal. In 1 Peter 5, 13, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son, which indicates to me that Mark was likely converted by Peter himself. Else why would he call him my son? 
It's interesting in the book of Acts chapter 12 that when Peter was released from prison, he went to the house of Mary where they were having a prayer meeting for him and she was the mother of John Mark. He must have had some kind of an intimate connection with Mark's family because after he gets out of jail, that's the first place he goes and he calls him my son. So we see from this that both Mark and Luke came within the scope of apostolic authority so that their books have all the authority of the apostles behind them, Paul even quoting Luke and calling what he wrote Scripture so that we can say every book of the New Testament comes directly from an apostle or indirectly through his direct influence. So this, these 27 books are the collected testimony and witness of the apostles. Now, while we're on this, let's go back to the upper room discourse. And for you in Canada, where this is going to, you're going to get this one again. So if you miss this point, don't worry. I'm going to come back at it again. In fact, I didn't get to it last time where I was showing what makes up the canon of the Bible. And we got the canon of the Old Testament, the 39 books. We need to get the canon of the New Testament. And that's what this is about. So you'll hear this again and it won't hurt you. Because Peter said, I will stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So I've got scripture. But So if you doze off on this, this one, don't snap your finger and say, oh shoot, I missed that. You'll get it again. John fourteen twenty six. Not that I'm encouraging you to doze off, but if you do, I'm giving you a freebie. John 14, some of you, the rest of you in here that look like you're about to go though, don't get that freebie, so you better make an effort to stay awake. John fourteen twenty six. But the comforter... The Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you, talking to these apostles, all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. This is why we have the four Gospels. Because the Holy Spirit reminded these men of what happened in the life of Christ because that's what the four Gospels are all about, isn't it? Isn't it about the life of Christ from the beginning to the end? What he taught, what he did? from his baptism all the way to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven with the promise to come again. The Holy Spirit put them in remembrance of that, and that's why we have four Gospels. And it's important to understand that there was more than just their memories and the power of their memories at work in rendering the Gospel records. There's something interesting we're told about the life of Christ in John's Gospel, which shows that they needed more than just their personal memory power to put together these four Gospels and remember everything they did. In John 21, 25, John said, And there are, also, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. My, my, can you imagine a life that rich, that full, That if you wrote everything that happened within that life, the world isn't big enough to contain the books that ought to be written. You know what that tells me? A very important thing. It's not the number of years you put in in this world that counts. It's what you put in the years. It's what you put in the years. And for many of us, And for some of you particularly, you got a late start in being a Christian. So there's a whole lot before that that you really wouldn't count as some of your greatest accomplishments. Make the years count, people. It's not how many you put in, it's what you put in them. It is amazing that some people who have lived very short lives have left an amazing impact. Do you realize that Matthew Henry died in his early 50s? Look at his work. Look at his scholarship. I stand amazed at what that man produced in so short of time. One of the greatest ever written by a man that I think died at 54 years old. 51? Was it 51? Shakespeare, 51. It's amazing. (laughs) I heard a black preacher on the radio one time And he said, I ain't going to tell you how old I am, but I'll tell you this much. I'm older than Jesus was when he died. (laughs) Well, Jesus put a lot in. 
those 33 and a half years, especially, and most of it, the last three and a half. It's amazing. Amazing. So anyway, I've always thought that was funny. So when you look at how much the apostles did, I mean, how much Jesus accomplished, I mean, there's no way. All that Jesus did exceeded the power of any human, normal human memory. So what we have was the comfort of the Holy Ghost bringing to their remembrance just the things that He wanted recorded. Their account comes to us not just by the, their memory power, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit reminding them of what they saw and what they heard from Jesus. Therefore, the gospel records are more than just their testimony. It's the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And this is exactly what it's called in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Watch it. For the testimony of Jesus, which the four gospels are is the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit brought to their remembrance what they saw, what they heard, and they transmitted it under that inspiration. And thus, this is more than just the testimony of the apostles. It is the testimony of the Holy Spirit of prophecy. Furthermore, as we're back to the upper room discourse, we jump over to chapter 16. So we have the four Gospels, the record of what Christ did and taught, that the apostles were personal witnesses of, transmitted to us through their ministry. Then we come to uh, John 16, 12 through 13. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Notice that. And He shall glorify Me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles in all truth. And as a result of that, we have the epistles. This is stuff. Remember, Jesus said there were... In fact, I meant to read verse 12, where he said, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. They had not reached a point yet where their understanding and maturity was sufficient to bear some things that he yet had to tell them. Some other things yet needed to happen. They needed to to be witnesses of the crucifixion. They needed to see all those prophecies fulfilled in the crucifixion. They needed to see Him rise from the dead and ascend back into heaven and the Holy Spirit to come down at Pentecost. And it was then that they could start putting a lot of things together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so He guided them into truth that at that point they were not yet able to bear. And that truth we have recorded in the epistles, which come to us through the Holy Spirit, further instructing and guiding the apostles into all truth. I'm telling you, brethren, in the 66 books of our Bible, concluded with the 27 of the New Testament, we have all the truth that God wants us to have by inspiration of His Holy Spirit. And like I told you, I'm glad He's not still giving us more because I haven't even figured out what I've got. It's a full-time job for me to keep digging and digging and I am finally reconciled that there's whole bunches of the Bible I'm never going to understand. I remember my daughter, I've told you the story before, reading the prophecy of Zechariah. She was sitting up in the top of her bunk bed reading Zechariah's prophecy and she said, Dad, I knew she wanted to ask me, what is this talking about? And so she went there and I looked down and I saw she was reading Zechariah. I said, Honey... (laughs) I can't explain it. There's just some stuff there I have not figured out yet. Maybe there's others that have, but you know what? Let me tell you something about Ben Mott. I don't preach anything I don't make mine. I got to make it mine first. I can't do it just because somebody else says that's the way it is. I got to be sure of it for myself. Otherwise, I do what old Norman Cooper said with parts of the Bible. He said, if it leaves me alone, I leave it alone. I've got my work cut out for me just to preach Paul's epistles. That's what my ministry is primarily to be. Pauline, preaching Paul's understanding. It took me five years to get through Ephesians 
You notice I haven't tackled another Pauline epistle yet. You know one reason? I'm not certain I got enough life left to get through it. (laughs) Anyway, who knows? I'm sure I couldn't live through Romans. I I just don't think I have enough years to get through that one with all there is in that. Yeah, I know I've grown. I know I've grown in the Lord. I know I have because I did a series of Bible studies on the book of Romans in Jim's basement when I first came here. Polished it off in a matter of a few weeks. Impossible now. Yeah, I could do that one. I could do that one. I, I could get that one in about six months. I could probably do that. <laughs> I was just reading. Interesting, you may mention that I was reading. I'm reading this book on the language arts. Uh, in Shakespeare by Sister Miriam Joseph, that brilliant scholar. And like I've said, that woman, that woman forgot more about grammar than I will ever know. She just is constantly popping up terms for inventions of language and, and, and arts of language that I have never heard of and will never be able to remember them all. And she showed where one fellow took Philemon's epistle and broke it, d- broke it down. And it's amazing the logic and the syllogisms that are wrapped in those few verses. Amazing stuff. Man, this book is, comes from the Logos, Jesus Christ, the ultimate source of all logic. And it's throughout the book, but that's, that's another story. And anyway, um, we have the epistles because of the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles into all truth. But bear in mind, and I called your attention to this in verse 13 at the end, he said he'd show them things to come. And that's why we find in the epistles some things with regard to future events. We have prophetic parts of the epistles, and we have the book of Revelation. And so there you have the New Testament coming from the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through the testimony and instruction of this that we know, understand, and believe what we believe, and that answers the prayer of the Son of God, as you're going to take you now to John chapter 17. It's important to understand in John 17 that in the first parts of John 17, the prayer is primarily for the apostles. He's talking about, he's praying for the apostles and the ministry that they would exercise. But he brings us into that prayer in these words when he says in John 17, 20, neither pray I for these alone, just these apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me. Do you believe on Jesus this morning? Then this, he's praying for you too. But now notice how you believe. Through their word, which is what I've already stressed to you, that you believe what you believe because of what they reported to you that you have received in faith. We believe through the word of the apostles. So brethren, this is what makes the apostles so important. Everything we know about Jesus Christ and his religion, we get through their written testimony, because our Lord never wrote anything lasting. We only read of the Son of God writing one time, and that's in John 8, when He wrote in the ground, something that would soon be erased. And we are not even told what He wrote. Some have tried to conjecture, but that's all it is, is conjecture. He wrote one time that we're told, and we don't even know what it was. So everything we know about Jesus Christ, we know because they wrote it. Today we're going to keep the Lord's Supper in obedience to the commandment of Christ. How do we know He kept the Lord's Supper? How do we know He instituted it? How do we know He met with the disciples for that Passover before He died? How do we know that He told us to take it and eat it and drink it? How do we know? We know because they told us. We got the information from them. That's how we know. That's the only way we know. You never met Jesus personally to have him tell you what he did back then. And you never read a book that he wrote that told you what he did back then. This, we get this through them. Now that that may not make any impression on you at all. But it makes a profound impression on me. And it makes me realize 
that some of the most important people in my life are people I have never personally met that actually have given me more and done more for me than any man I ever met. Because anything that any man gave me that's of them, he got from somebody, from somebody, from somebody that got it from them. They are the original source. This makes their office, as I say, of utmost importance. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians 1. Therefore, if we would be Christians, and don't you want to be a Christian? You say, well, I thought I was. Well, that's a good start. Would you like to stay a Christian? Because you can quit being one. You can't quit being a child of God. You can quit being a Christian. I've seen plenty of people quit being Christians, sadly. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Some people stay on the books, but they're not Christian. Just because you have your name on that church roll, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. How are you living? How are you living? Christian. That's Christ-like, a follower of Christ. So notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 5 and 6. Paul writes to these Thessalonians and says, Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now he's speaking here of we, we. And you'll notice up there at the top, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus. Paul and Silvanus were both apostles. So you got two apostles writing here. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us, us apostles, and in following the apostles and of the Lord. You are not following Jesus if you don't follow the apostles. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So if you would be a Christian... And if we would thus be a Christian church, we must be followers of the apostles, and thus we must be an apostolic church. An apostolic church is not one necessarily that has the name splattered on the book board, though you will find that in places. It's the people that are following the doctrine and practice of the apostles as laid down in the New Testament, and in following them they follow the Lord and are thus a Christian church apostolic church. There's no other kind to want to be. Correctly, that is. Brethren, this is so important that we must attend to the doctrine and fellowship of the apostles in order to have the doctrine and the fellowship that is of God. I'll give you two passages. In Acts 2.42. In Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. These are the first people that got added to the church after the Holy Spirit descended upon it and the apostles began to bear witness under the power of that Holy Spirit as Jesus said they would do when the Comforter came. He said, right after talking about the Comforter coming in John 15, he said, and you shall be my witnesses. And this is exactly, exactly what we see happening in Acts. And so then they, verse 41, that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They got 3,000 new church members. And I thought I was having a monumental event when I baptized 20, well, I think 23 in one day in Las Vegas. I thought that was phenomenal. That wasn't a drop in the bucket compared to this. I haven't baptized 3,000 people in my entire life. I've baptized over 300. That's one-tenth of what these guys did in a day. And they, these 3,000 souls, together with those to whom they were added, continued steadfastly, watch it now, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You see, they were an apostolic Christian church. 
They had the apostles' doctrine. They had the apostles' fellowship. And that's the one you've got to have to have the one that's of God. Come over to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. 1 John 4 and verse 6. And John again is speaking as an apostle. Remember, he'd opened it up, speaking of himself in company of other apostles when he said that which was from the beginning which we have heard and which we have seen. That which we've, we, apostles, have seen and heard. So he's speaking as an apostle and he says, we are of God. These apostles are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. If you pay attention to the teaching of the apostles and you can grasp it, understand it, believe it, embrace it, you are of God. You know God. You know God. He that is not of God heareth not us. You can tell when a religious movement or a preacher or a professing Christian is not of God when you stick apostolic doctrine in front of their face and they turn it away and walk away from it and think it doesn't matter and they don't care. They are not of God no matter how much they claim to be. Sit there and take grape juice and crackers for communion or leavened bread and Stuff like that and let any and everybody off the street come in and sit whether they're baptized or not and think it doesn't matter. That's not apostolic order. That's not what the apostles taught. Then you show them right out of the Bible. Oh, well, that's your opinion. You ever heard that one? That's your interpretation. Interpretation, my hind leg. I'm reading the words off the page. It's your interpretation. Have you had that one pulled on you? Of course you have. Which meaning, which being interpreted is this. You can't depend on what the words say. You just go by whatever you imagine that you would like for them to say that makes you feel good in whatever it is you've decided you want to do regardless of what God said. And brethren, we can think of other people but examine yourself, has that ever been the case with you? He that, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You want to be able to discern between right and wrong? You've got the apostles' teaching and doctrine. There's your, there's your standard. There's your grid to run everything through to see if it's true or see if it's false. Now, having put it that way, does that make the apostles important or does that make the apostles important? The most important men that we could ever know or have anything to do with. Now we come back to John 15 and verse 16 where Jesus is speaking to them and says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Now that was true, of course, with regard to their eternal salvation. But in this particular context, it narrows in to the apostolic office. Christ chose them for that office rather than their choosing Him. They were not apostles because they chose that for their career. They were apostles because Jesus chose them for that career. And that lines right up with Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. And when it was day, He called unto Him His disciples, and of them He chose. He chose twelve. They didn't choose Him he chose them, twelve, whom also he named apostles. And then I take you back to Mark 3.13. I told you there was something important there and I'll call your attention to it now. And it underscores what he's saying when he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I tell you what, you don't want a pastor that is one because he chose it for his profession. Amen. You want one God chooses. And I'm going to tell you, anybody in his right mind wouldn't choose this if he didn't have to. <laughs> Conrad's advice to a man he trained and ordained was this, run, and if you can get away from it, good. Hope you never catch up with it. 
I can tell you. I remember it. I, I, I may have told you this story the other day. Or maybe, I don't remember to whom I told it, but I know I told it recently. So you'll just have to pardon an old man a senior moment. <laughs> you get those when you get my age. In fact, like Conrad said one time, I asked him, I said, do you ever have senior moments? He said, I live for the junior moments. <laughs> uh, to which I can only say, amen. The church was putting me up down south and um, exercising me. Just I would introduce the service, take a scripture, make a little talk. And I was invited out. Our pastor at the time was a man named Elder William Hull, Bill Hull. Loved the man dearly. Didn't have him for our pastor very long. He died. But um, I was invited out to one of the deacons' house for lunch. And Brother Hull was there and the deacon. And I remember the deacon saying, we were sitting, I can still see we're sitting in the den. And he said, our church, you have to excuse me, believes you have a gift. What are you going to say when we want to liberate you? Which was something they did before they ordained you and you had license to go in the pulpit and start preaching. He said, what are you going to say when our church wants to liberate you? I was just an 18-year-old boy. And I said, I can't preach. So what I'm trying to tell you is, I didn't run after this, folks. I said, I can't preach. And Brother Hull said, do you find yourself telling this news to everybody and everything you can? And I would stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom and preach. I'd be walking along uh, 20th Avenue in Birmingham after I'd get off the bus walking to college, and I'd be preaching as I walked down the street. And I knew if I told him no, I'd be lying. I had to say, yes, they had me. And the rest is history, and here I am. So, verse 13. Yeah. And it got me. It sure did. Mark 3.13, so he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto them whom he would. See, not whom they would, whom he would. And so he selected these people himself. They didn't select him or this office for themselves. He did. He said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And I want to point out something that I pointed out to you before when I was preaching on the word of the truth of the gospel. Forms of the word choose and elect, and they're synonyms of each other. They mean the same thing. Forms of the word choose and elect are used in the New Testament 61 times. With the exception of 10 times, it is God that is doing the choosing. Of the 10 times in which men are choosing, none of them are choosing Christ for eternal salvation. In fact, the only verse that specifically mentions men choosing Christ is this verse in John 15, 16. It's the only verse that ever mentions men choosing Christ and it puts it in these words, you have not chosen me. Now you imagine building an entire system of soteriology, that is the doctrine of salvation, on the idea that men choose Christ for their Savior, and the only verse that you've got talking about men choosing Christ is one that says, you have not chosen me. I don't consider that a whole lot of good positive information to build a soteriology. Do you? (laughs) Now, among the twelve that Christ chose was Judas Iscariot. You can read that in Luke chapter 6. You just, it's just right there in the plain black and white testimony of the verse. When we read in Luke six thirteen, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, they were brothers, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. Now, observe there were two Judases. 
you. That's important to remember. And the Holy Spirit helps you out there because there is a place in John 14 where a Judas posits a question. Not, it may not be John 14. Let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was John 14 where Judas asks Christ a question and it makes it plain it was not Iscariot. <laughs> so there were two Judases and one was the traitor. And Christ chose him to be an apostle and sent him out and gave him the power to preach the gospel heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. He had all these miraculous gifts. And I'm sure if you and I had had the opportunity to hear Judas Iscariot preach, we might have thought, my, what a fine preacher he is. And yet he was a traitor. And uh, Jesus knew it when he chose him. In John chapter 6 and verse 70, He said, have not I chosen you twelve? Talk about choosing them for the apostolate. And one of you is a devil. But the interesting thing is, is that although he was chosen to be an apostle, he was not chosen to be a child of God. You come to John 13, 10 and 11. Jesus said, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. That's talking about the washing of regeneration, the full cleansing of our person. I preached on that when I was preaching on John 15, 3. And ye are clean in that respect, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, ye are not all clean. And on down in verse um, 18, he said, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. So indeed and in fact, the Lord chose Judas for the office of the apostle, but he did not choose him as a child of God, which tells us something very plain. And that is that a person can have spiritual gifts that does not have spiritual life. So when charismatics say that the classic evidence that we are children of God is that we have the spiritual gifts, they err. For Judas had them. Spiritual gifts and not spiritual life. So I draw from this a startling and disturbing conclusion. There can be men that are able ministers and preachers that will burn in hell. Scary. It's scary. Exactly. Exactly he did. Exactly. Some of the greatest prophecies you'll ever read are the prophecies delivered by Balaam the hireling prophet. What God is looking for as proof you are His child is not whether you can speak in tongues or perform miracles or bring eloquent speeches. God is looking for the fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That proves you're a child of God. And not just having these impressive gifts. It's very important that we understand this in this age of charismania. Very important that we understand that. You sometimes wonder why Judas, why the Lord would have chosen somebody that turned out so rotten. I think maybe part of it was to give comfort to guys like myself that there have been men, it's possible for me to train and ordain a man that I think is one of God's only to find out later on he's a devil. If it can happen to the Lord, it can happen to any of us. They get into the church. But you know the interesting thing? (laughs) He wrote no scripture. Because scripture comes from holy men of God, and he was not that. Interesting. Scary, but interesting. And so... Christ said he had chosen them, and he said he ordained them. I've chosen you and ordained you. The word ordained means to appoint a person to a charge, duty, or office. This ordination of them was his appointment of them to the office of an apostle. And we can see that again by going back to Mark chapter 3. 
Mark 3, 14, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. So he ordained them right here, just as he had chosen them. Luke said he chose them. Here it says he ordained them that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. And then we go back to our verse and he says, Henceforth, I, uh, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go. And go they did. They would go. Why? Because they were sent. And do you know what the word apostle means? It means a person sent. And that's why Jesus, when he ordained them, they should go. He called them apostles because they were the ones that he sent. John 17, 18. Notice as he prays for them in John 17, 18. He says, as thou hast sent me into the world, which by the way shows us that Jesus Christ was also an apostle. And he is called the apostle and high priest of our profession in Acts chapter, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. He was sent from God to us. I love that verse, Hebrews 3, 1. He's called the apostle and high priest of our profession. As an apostle, God sent him to us. As a priest, he goes from us on our behalf to God. Isn't that neat? As an apostle to us, as a priest from us to God. So we... We're covered in both directions. And so he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also send them into the world. And that's again what the word apostle means. John chapter 20, verse 21, he's speaking to them. They go because they are sent, which is what their name means as apostle. One sent. In John 20, 21, Jesus saith to them again, Peace be unto you, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And again, he chose them and ordained them that they should go. He gives them two commissions. And in both commissions, guess what he tells them to do? Hmm? Go. (laughs) He chose them and ordained them that they should go. The first commission, when he first chooses them, is Matthew chapter 12. Matthew, pardon me, Matthew chapter 10, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. After he's chosen the 12 apostles. And you have to compare the accounts of the lists because there is some variation in the names. But you put them together, you can figure it all out. And we read in verse 5, you see they had more than one name, which is not uncommon. We talked about that the other night in Bible study. These 12, Jesus sent forth, which is why they're called apostles, because that's what the word means. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go. Go. But now notice a restriction. Not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So at first they're only to go in the nation of Israel, among the region of Judea. But then after he dies and rises from the dead and the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been nailed to the cross and taken out of the way, the commission is broadened. Speaking now to the 11, Judas Iscariot's out of the picture now. So we've just got the 11 and we've got to replace him and we'll do that in Acts chapter 1. But for now we've got the 11 and he says to them in Acts, uh, pardon me, Matthew 28 verse 19, Go ye, there it is, I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then look at the words of the commission in Mark chapter 16 and verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, these are the apostles, as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go. So there you've got it. Three times. Go, go, go. I've chosen you and ordained you that ye should go. And go they did, because we read there in verse 20, and they went forth. Why did they go forth? Because they were sent forth. They were told to go. And they went forth. Went, past tense of go. Go, they went forth and preached everywhere. Where did he tell them to preach? Everywhere, all nations, all the world. They did that. 
everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And so much so did they fulfill the commission that Christ gave to them that by the time you get to the epistle of Colossians, we are told in chapter 1 and verse 6, the gospel had gone into all the world. And in verse 23, it had been preached to every creature under heaven. Just like Mark said, they went everywhere. And they did in fulfillment of that commission. So, it was in obedience to that commission they went forth and preached everywhere. And that was part of their office as an apostle as we read in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. Romans 1 and verse 5. Speaking of the risen Christ, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. For what purpose? For obedience to the faith among all nations, for His name. Oh, that is so rich. He sent them into all nations. They went into all nations. Christian churches were planted thick throughout the Mediterranean world, throughout the Western world. And then those churches and the ministers of those churches answering the call of apostolic instruction to do the work of an evangelist continued to propagate the gospel. And it just went out, out among the nations for the obedience to the faith. And among all the nations, you had believers, you had churches. It moved out from there all the way through Western Europe and it came over the ocean into the Americas. It's gone around the globe and it reached us and we're obeying the faith being among all those nations in answer to it as a result of the ministry of the apostles. Well, there's something else he told them to do, and I'm not going to get to that today. He said he chose them, and we've seen that. They didn't choose him. He ordained them, and we've seen that. And then he sent them forth to go, and we see that they went. And he said that they should bring forth fruit that their ministries should have effect. And indeed, they did. I just told you, Christianity and Christian churches were planted thick throughout the Western world. And that Western world civilized the rest of the globe. This is the fruit of the apostles. And what they planted is still with us today. It's sitting in this room. We're part of the remaining fruit of the ministry of these apostles. Can you join in me with an amen when I say thank God for the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We owe our life to them, brethren. We owe what we have today to them. And so we'll let that be the conclusion of the message.